who has access to what? This is the Identity at the Center podcast. If you're looking for identity and access management talk, you've come to the right place. And now, on to the show. Welcome to yet another episode of the Identity at the Center podcast. Uh, certainly been appreciating the likes and ratings we've been getting. If you like what you hear, do us a favor, share the show with other like-minded individuals. And uh, you can also email us at questions at identityatthecenter.com. I am Jeff, and that is Jim's voice you're about to hear. Jim? Hey, Jeff. Survive the hurricane. Survive the hurricane. Well, so far, anyway. Well, I'm 100 miles inland, and that helped. <laughs> yeah, so then I guess I'm a hurricane survivor as well, too, being up in the Chicago area. That's um, right. Yeah. We were joined today by Morgan McNamara. She's one of our crack members of our engineering team here at Identropy. Hello, Morgan. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Good. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, no problem. So, Jeff, I want to clarify. By yeah. being a crack member, that doesn't mean you smoke crack, right? They don't have – well – you know, that's a personal question. I don't think that that's probably right for the podcast. I think as long as the work gets done, <laughs> hey, man, whatever. <laughs> could be a Not that I'm condoning that behavior. Uh, yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> so uh, today is Thursday. Do you know what today is, Jim? Morgan, take a guess. Other than, you know, podcast day. Hmm. Thursday is our OWASP days. It's, it's an OWASP day. It's not that. It is the opening night of the NFL. Ooh. Bears, Packers. My Bears actually are looking good now, so there's a chance that we might actually beat the Packers on Thursday Night Football tonight to open the season. I'm very excited about this. Now, those teams have probably played about 100 times. Yeah, and it's relatively even. Even though the Packers seem like they've been dominating the Bears for the last uh, decade or so, the the actual overall record is relatively close, which is makes it one of the better rivalries. Yeah, cool. Um, Morgan, do you have a team that you follow in the NFL? Oh, God. Um <laughs> Out of obligation, I have to say the Buffalo Bills. Oh, right on. Yeah. Go Bills. My dad is a Bills fan, so uh, I get you on that one. He's from yeah. New Fane and Rochester area. So, uh, uh, so yeah, the Bills were his team. Okay, yeah, that's like right next to me. I'm from I'm from Buffalo, so um, try your hardest, Bills. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim, do you follow a team? Eagles. E- oh, that's right, Eagles, of course. Um, did you see that the Eagles offensive line did the ESPN body issue? No. <laughs> yeah. So if, uh, if that's your thing, um, yeah, the Eagles just offensive not. Line <laughs> clear is not, <laughs> um, this is the first time in 25 years of NFL football that I'm not doing a fantasy football league. And I got to tell you, I find it to be quite freeing. I'm actually going to be able to watch the games and enjoy them rather than wonder, you know, how my running backs did or are, you know, having second thoughts around not starting one guy and him on the bench. So. I'm yeah, sorry. no, no. I, I stopped doing it about 10 years ago and I feel the same way. It was like, it was ruining the game for me. And I did the same thing with fantasy baseball where mm-hmm. it's like, you know, I was just so concerned with how individual players were doing it that it was, you know, ruining the sport for me. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out there listening, um, period. But <laughs> there are a lot of people out there listening who uh, play fantasy sports and love it. And I used to love it, but uh, I'm with you, man. You know, it's it's freeing. Yeah, I just, I don't know what it is. I just decided not to do it this year. And there's a certain, you know, freedom aspect to it. Anyway, uh, all right, let's 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 actually talk about identity access management um, and get us back on track here. <laughs> um, today, we're going to talk about a topic that was submitted to us by Neil, who listens to the show. Certainly appreciate his email. Um, let me go right into here what he writes. One area that I think would be pertinent to discuss is around the managing of identity in a multi-cloud environment. There is a growing movement toward vendor agnostic use of cloud services, and this drives some new thinking around how we approach identity. Do we centralize or distribute identity management? And he thinks that'd make a good subject, which I absolutely agree with. Um, so I want to let's let's start off with you know why do companies have multi-cloud environments? Morgan, do you want to take a stab at that, and then uh, Jim and I'll chime in. Um, my assumption would be that you know they have different platforms, different languages that they're using, um, and they're trying to sort of 
sequester each one of those to try and make it as secure as possible instead of integrating them all together um, in a single cloud instance. Uh, I think that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's a good answer. Um, you know, Jeff, what I've found is um, most clients that I work with um, are either in one of two camps. They're either in a single cloud environment, so they're using something like AWS or Microsoft Azure, and those are, you know, definitely the two that I see the the largest uptake on, at least the, the client base that we've been working with, uh, or they're in a multi-cloud and they have more than one, so they have AWS and Azure hosting. And so the ones that I find that are in that second scenario, and, and to be honest, I'm not an expert in the features of AWS, the features of Azure, or any of the other cloud platforms. Um, but from you know the, the level that I'm at, the feature there seems to be a lot of feature parity. I, I'm sure there's people out there pulling their hair out with me saying that, but you know for the most part, I'm finding that most clients aren't choosing AWS or Azure based on you know this feature or that feature, but more which company they align with better. Um, now, where I see the the situation where a client has m multiple clouds, um, maybe they even have multiple kind of instances within the same provider, it's kind of been thrust upon them in that their organization, um, you know, grew through acquisition or merger, uh, or they, um, you know, purchased some software that um, that was on one of the clouds and they were already on the other cloud uh, right. or that, you know, some decisions were made within their organization. One part of the organization went Microsoft, the other part went AWS. Now they're coming together and kind of starting to manage IT together. And so in other words, they're, they're kind of thrust into that situation. They didn't really choose multi-cloud. It just kind of happened. Yeah. I see us look at it like from a use case perspective, right? If you're, and the the idea that there's different parts of the business that have different use cases kind of plays into what you just said. If you're on the SharePoint side or if you're, you know, email, you're probably familiar with Azure from a cloud perspective. But there might be someone who is more on the Google side because of the strength of the analytics side um, that they might be having. So they're more familiar with that and they might have gone off and built something on Google's cloud platform, whereas, you know, developers might be looking at AWS and spinning up, you know, services there. So pulling things together is certainly you know, part of the challenge, I think, that comes along with it. But in my mind, I think it's, it's, it kind of goes with that use case, right? So if you're an Office 365 shop, you're on Azure, you know, whether, whether you like it or not, <laughs> you're already using Azure from that, from that approach. And then it becomes that, that question of, okay, well, we're already using here, right? Land and expand, which is, you know, the, the approach many software vendors will take is why don't you use, you know, Azure for the rest of your cloud services, whereas company might have, um, you know, other pockets of AWS. And that's, that's, I think that's pretty common. I think a lot of companies try to consolidate on one, but I like the security aspect um, that more, Morgan, you mentioned before around having things in kind of a little bit of a different silo where you don't have all your keys in one castle. So, you know, I think there is benefit to that as well, using the right tool for the job rather than, than trying to make, you know, one, um, one service meet all your needs when it may not, may not be the best for the business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I could just jump in and mention something interesting um, that I noticed when you guys were discussing that was that um, it's almost like there's this sort of resistance in a, in a sense to complete migration to cloud infrastructure because when you think of implementation of a cloud, it's really dissolving the traditional uh, perimeters that we've seen that have relied on things like a firewall and VPN. It's just you those just aren't as viable anymore. Um, you know, you're looking at a, a cross-platform system where you're trying to simplify the IT stack. Um, that elimination of the perimeter is gonna demand some sort of seamless implementation with a centralized user management tool. Um, and I, it, it almost sounds like companies are kind of afraid to do that. And they're trying to almost reestablish perimeters where they just tried to migrate to, um, a fragmentation of it. Yeah, I think the perimeter has gone at this point. I think that's a I think that's a losing effort <laughs> if you're yeah. trying to establish perimeter on the cloud. Um, Jim, what are some of the problems that you see if you're taking a multi-cloud approach? 
Well, I think that the biggest problem is the same if you have a single cloud approach, which is, uh, but it, you know, it's, it's obviously compounded. Um, the biggest problem is the number of secrets or credentials that it takes to run a large cloud environment. Um, you know, you have secrets for secrets or credentials for uh, the console to access infrastructure within your applications. They're embedded within configuration files or embedded service accounts. Um, so the, vol the volume of the number of credentials that you have to manage is in, in kind of a controlled fashion just becomes such a, a major effort that that's really the problem. And when you go to a multi-cloud, now you've compounded that you have as many as twice as many uh, secrets that you need to manage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a visibility issue too, right? If it's not being, if the cloud isn't being managed centrally, right? Some areas probably have different procedures and processes and policies for their own cloud, right? AWS might be managed different than Azure or, or Google. Um, and you may not have that visibility to know who has access to what, which is really kind of foundational for any IAM program, which it would be part of the security strategy. Yeah, I mean, think of how, um how much companies struggle to comply with their own policies in terms of password rotation when it comes to service accounts. You know, now you're looking at a new environment that oftentimes, a, you know, a cloud environment that spun up without information security uh, having a hands-on role. Now, I'm talking in generalities, right? Not every organization spun up their cloud infrastructure that way. But now you've got thousands of credentials that have to be managed and passwords that need to be rotated in compliance. And you may or may not have a technology solution supporting that. So I think that's really the problem. And then when you have multi-cloud, then you just picked up and repeated that, that same kind of problem um, in a second place or, or more. Or you could be talking about an internal private cloud, no matter how you look at it. The more places that you have to manage all these credentials, the harder the problem becomes to uh, manage. So it sounds like an answer might be some sort of centralization strategy across the cloud, or at least from a management standpoint. I mean, that's that's the answer to you know. So I think this gets to Neil's question because he's saying you know should we take a centralized approach or a distributed approach? I'm definitely in the camp of a centralized approach. I want centralized command and control centralized visibility into who has access to what, what they've done. Um, and I want to put together some guidelines or best practices um, that I can, you know, put into effect in, in terms of managing those identities within the cloud. And, you know, I've got some, some topics that I'd like to dive into or, or kind of best practices that I think that, you know, and, and kind of taking an approach of you've got to walk before you run. Um, Obviously, people who are listening to this podcast could be um, in different organizations that have that are at a different point in their life cycle that have um, different types of applications or running in different clouds. So I'm going to kind of start at the most basic level in terms of here are the approaches that I think need to be tackled, and then we'll get into the more advanced stuff. All right, let's hit it. What's number one? Okay, so starting on you know from the basics. Um, strong authentication practices. So, um, you know, starting with the assumption that you've got good practices for managing identity. So just thinking of your employees, and including the population of people who do administrative like developer functions in the cloud, that you've got good lifecycle management or identity governance practices uh, for those people today. You know, who works here, who gets access to what, and most importantly, when they leave that you're cutting off that access. And if you have that and you kind of centralize that, say around your active directory, um, then you can plug in your access to the cloud through your corporate single sign-on solution uh, or PAM solution. I think, you know, either one of those technologies has, is kind of trying to solve this problem. But what I see the most is organizations starting with managing the console, kind of the management interface for their cloud and guarding that, providing single sign on to that with their SSO solution. So like Okta or Ping or, or one login or something like that. And then ideally like on a, top of yeah, Like okay, a PAM perfect. solution work with, with, with that approach as well? 
something like yeah, I mean a, a PAM solution or HashiCorp or CyberArk. Yeah, a lot of those um, a lot of those vendors have solutions developed around um, Azure and AWS specifically. I think AWS is probably the one that I see addressed the most. Um, but I think every um, solution that's trying to uh, tackle this problem is really focused on providing a solution for AWS as well as Microsoft. So um, yeah, there are there are solutions out there that uh, would allow you to use your PAM solution, which has its own set of benefits. Those benefits are kind of more down the line of more advanced benefits than what I was planning on going through at the moment. Because what I wanted to talk about next was you know, with authentication. So if we're just talking about access to the console at the moment and providing single sign-on, using your account that has good IGA practices around it that's getting disabled when you leave the organization. On top of that, I want to layer multi-factor authentication because, you know, your, your web console is going to be available over the open internet, and we want to make sure that we're providing a very strong authentication uh, mm -hmm. to log in. So you've got MFA, you got strong credentials. Um, Morgan, I know you had some experience working through AWS. Um, when you're logging into AWS, did you did you have MFA enabled uh, when you were trying to, to get access to the console? So when I was setting up access to the console, I actually because I directly signed in through AWS's um, web browser, I did not have to do multi-factor. Mm. Okay, so that might be a recommendation for a former, <laughs> uh, a former uh, client, <laughs> a former uh, colleague, right? Employer, yeah. Really, yeah. Really, at this point, password only isn't good enough, right? I, I think that's kind of like preaching something that we say all the time. You got to put MFA everywhere as much as you can, especially on the cloud. Um, you know, it's like every week there's like a new article around how you know someone's cloud got breached. Uh, you know, S3 bucket wasn't configured correctly and uh, was exposed. I mean, there's just, there's so many things that can go wrong. And I think that's what scares maybe some of the people who may be more hesitant to adopt the cloud, uh, going back to a point where, you know, Morgan, you made earlier, um, but it's coming. I mean, you just can't start putting, you know, racks and racks of servers in your environment where you've got to do a good job of securing access to them. Um, and you talk about authentication and, and I, from my perspective, I look at it as you've got to know what you've got before you can protect it. So you got to know who has access to what, you got to know what all the different counts are, especially if you're working off the compounded problem where you're using multi-cloud and you have different, uh, you know, vendors. Get that inventory in place. Um, know what the accounts are. Know what the permissions are. Start to figure out which ones are human and which ones are machine. Right. So, a lot of development takes place. So, you want to make sure that you identify, you know, what's actually being controlled by a person. What might be more programmatic. Um, and then I would look to centralize it as well. So I certainly agree with that approach. Uh, maybe putting something in front of it like the SSO solution makes sense. Uh, and then using the MFA that's part of the SSO solution to get access to uh, the cloud environment, in my mind, would probably be a good you know, first step towards that. Yeah, I mean, that's what I really feel strongly about is that, you know, from a console perspective, because I think that's where someone can inflict the most bet, uh, the most damage, right? They can yeah. change settings, they can allow themselves access to many of the, you know, instances, the server instances or the uh, platform services through the console. So if they can get into the console with a very, um, you know, very strict role or a very high level role, um, they could do a lot of damage. So it's kind of basic blocking and tackling of using your SSO solution, MFA, uh, strong password policy, and then using any other policies that make business sense. I mean, there, if you don't, you shouldn't have people accessing during certain times of the day or from different IP ranges than your corporate network, then go ahead and put those policies in place. Anything you can do to uh, restrict access to just those folks that should be accessing that environment um, all the better. Yeah, and a lot of these vendors also have things like conditional access, right? So you can do things around geolocation, you know, device fingerprinting, you know, that, that sort of thing. It's uh, become pretty uh, commonplace today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember when that used to be like, Ooh, wow, we're cool because you know, we can do this and others can't, but now it's almost a standard feature amongst, you know, most, um, right. Access management providers. Um, so now it's kind of looking for ways to differentiate between those. You know, I see things that like, like HashiCorp, 
you know, they specialize in, you know, cloud management, DevOps, that's those sorts of things that might be interesting to look at. Um, one area that I think is, has a lot of potential would be more of a, like a just-in-time provisioning of access um, where people don't have permissions all the time, right? They get them just when they need them and then those permissions are pulled back or, you know, whatever the roles are, the entitlements are that give them access. Um, you know, there's products out there like Plain ID. You can even do something, you know, through an, through an IGA uh, tool, identity governance administration tool, like, you know, potentially SailPoint or Sabian or things like Oracle or IBM, you know, those sorts of things. Right. It's a lot more complicated, though, when you're trying to do it that way, because you really have to know, you know, what are the permissions and then who's going to approve it. If it's something that's critical from like a time frame perspective, you know, is that approver available right, to, to put that in there? We see these challenges sometimes on the privilege access management side, too, right? Just even inside the firewall, people getting access to servers and there's this stigma of red tape that kind of goes around privilege access management processes that could easily, you know, happen on, on the cloud side, too. Right. You know, where I think privilege access management um, really gets you the most mileage is beyond just accessing the console. When you start getting into managing your server instances and managing the accounts that have access. So one of the other um, tips or keys that I have is, you know, making sure that each person who has to access servers has um, their own set of credentials that you're not sharing credentials over a group of people. So for example, if you're using a Linux instance on a, on an AWS EC2 server, um, those keys should be individually, um, individually uh, provisioned per person. So private keys should be private to the user. Um, where a privilege access management system could be, really advantageous when it comes to managing those instances is um, to allow temporary access. The person doesn't actually need to know the password to the account on that server. Um, and then of course you could set the, the firewall rules on the console to only allow the um, only allow the IP address or the IP range that the privilege access management server exists on to actually access the server. So then you have some network access controls, you know, additional network access controls um, guarding access to that server. So um, some good, and, and that's kind of basic blocking and tackling for the enterprise. So a lot of the best practices for managing your server environment in the enterprise move over to um, managing the servers in the cloud as well. Jeff, one thing you mentioned about HashiCorp, I mean, what I would recommend for anybody who's listening, um, to go out to their website, watch some of the, the videos that they have posted, their, their tech talks with their, their co-CTOs. I mean, those guys are both um, really, really bright and, and they really understand the space and they can walk you through a lot of the ways to approach. Now, their focus is primarily, I think, around managing DevOps, managing um, really secrets in the, in the cloud. Um, and those secrets a lot of times are go back to if you're looking at this from a developer standpoint, you're publishing applications out of the cloud. But I think that's a lot of what we're talking about today, managing a multi-cloud environment. So I think that's a, a really good vendor to bring up relative to this discussion. You know, I think that DevOps is something that um, you don't want to forget about. How do you deploy apps without hard coding secrets? So you look at technologies like HashiCorp. Um, it's a way to have your applications programmatically go out and fetch your secrets rather than having to hard code them into configuration files. Um, and the same with your DevOps tools like, uh, like Kubernetes, not having to hard code all those credentials into, uh, into something that can be seen by multiple people within the organization. Yeah, that takes a lot of work though too, because if, if you haven't built out applications with that in mind, right, if more of like a legacy type approach, um, trying to go back and reconfigure applications to use um, the programmatic means to pull keys from vaults and those sorts of things can take some time. So it's definitely not something that happens from an overnight perspective. But I think, I think HashiCorp would be a good one to look at, you know, maybe something like Plain ID as well, if you're looking for more like a just-in-time provisioning, I think they have some interesting use cases that, that might be helpful for people who are looking at managing access to uh, cloud environments. 
The other thing I think you brought up a good point about, um, you know, it's a lot of work. I don't think that I am poker manager can go in and, 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 um, you know, be confrontational, if you will, about trying to implement security. You really have to partner with your development team. They have to see the value in having checks and balances and see the value in, um, you know, the visibility that they can get and the manageability that they can get. Um, a lot of times you run into kind of the mindset that, well, there's only 10 people in the department. They've all worked here, you know, three, three or more years. We trust them. The thing is security is, you know, not about trusting people. It's about being, you know, being able to not have to rely on trust. It's being sure that you have the security controls. That everybody knows that, hey, if you try to do something, we're going to know about it. And I think from an IM program manager perspective, the way I'd look at it is to try to partner with the manager of applications because I think that, you know, they're going to have to adopt this technology more or less willingly uh, for it to be a success. And they should look at the IM team as a partner, somebody who can provide administration of that, of these platforms and be a proper checks and balances that, um, can allow them to focus on development and not have to focus on security as much. Right. Um, so I, I think hopefully that helps kind of put at least our opinions around that for Neil and maybe other folks who were having similar questions. I think to sum it up, right, we're, we're fans of centralizing it, but you've got to have good policy and procedure, you know, back ending that, you know, the right kind of technology approach and how you'd want to manage the permissions and making sure you don't forget about humans and non-humans, right? The programmatic side of things, DevOps, et cetera. Um, getting access to the cloud. Um, I'd like to kind of pivot back a little bit to Morgan um, and kind of talk a little bit about her background because I think she's got kind of an interesting story where, uh, you know, how people, we, if you remember one of our first episodes was, you know, how people got into IAM. Most of us kind of fell into it. And I think Morgan's another good example of that. Um, Morgan has an amazing LinkedIn profile, by the way which I will definitely link in the show notes. So kudos to you, Morgan. Thank <laughs> <on that>. you. <laughs> um, definitely shows off some of the writing skills uh, there. Maybe you can talk, Morgan, about how you got, how, how you, how, you know, how, how did you get into IAM? I guess let's start there. Yeah, sure. So um, as I mentioned kind of before the call, um, I was an English major originally, um, graduated and did some writing for online news journals but there was a shift to paying writers in terms of publishing where, you know, there was no actual monetary value attached to your quote unquote payment. So from there I kind of pivoted and um, went into code uh, as someone who obviously has a respect for language. I figured the language of computers might be something pretty fascinating, and I was not wrong. Um, definitely in some regards, kind of being a professional student, which I loved. Um, I started attending the local weekly OWASP meetings that we have in Austin. Um, through that, I met someone who is one of the board members for an, a hospital application called OpenEMR, and that's open source and charity-based um, all the developer activity on that is out of people's own pockets and time. Um, through that, uh, the person who kind of recruited me onto the project saw how willing I was to learn and to kind of experiment with things. So he kind of threw me towards the AWS implementation where we migrated the patient document database to cloud native. Um, and that's really how I fell into identity access management. And here you are. How long did it take to do that migration? Um, gosh, I'm going to say a couple months, maybe two months. And that was what, re-architecting the application, moving data stores around? Yeah, my, uh, my personal involvement with it was a little more spotty because I was learning and self-teaching and um, also working on code, code base infrastructure at that point as well with open EMR. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of being thrown around there. Um, I think that's, I think that's fascinating. It's, it's such a, such an interesting pivot to go from English, you know, major, <laughs> you know, writing into uh, technology like that, I guess, you know, what are some of the languages that 
well, I guess, what was the first language that you learned on the IT side of things? Yeah, so um, when I first got interested in this, and I say this is in coding in general, um, I went to OWASP and I was initially just filling a, a notebook as a dictionary basically with terminology and uh, I was like okay does anyone have any recommendations for what I should start with and someone said Python so that's actually where I started um, I wish I would have started with like you know Code Academy's command line because <laughs> my knowledge quickly became kind of Swiss cheese-esque and I had to go back a lot of times kind of backtrack and fill in knowledge holes to understand really why things were happening and how they happened. Um, but Python was first, and then I moved on to HTML, CSS, SQL. That's fascinating. Um, Jim, I think you probably have a question or two. Yeah, so um, actually one of the things, I just did want to close out one other last point that I wanted to make on the um, um, best oh, practice. I think it's just around logging and make sure that you have logging centrally set up um, to identify problems and, and setting up um, alerting. Um, and it, it kind of triggers me into another thought. So one of the things I started off this discussion around why organizations end up in multi-cloud and I said, well, the cloud seem pretty comparable. So in other words, if you're down kind of the checkbox list of you know, does it have uh, a NoSQL database? Does it have logging? It's like, yes, yes, yes. But they all operate a little bit differently. You know, they mostly follow some open standards and they have some proprietary connectors. And so it's probably not super easy to just pick up an application and run it in both environments and expect that it. you can't only do that at a very thin level, right? You have to integrate to the logging solution. So at, at, at many of the tiers of the application, you have to make them specific to the cloud that you're running in. And that's why I think it makes it harder to consolidate uh, clouds as well. It's like you can't just pick up all your applications in one. If you're using the platform services of the cloud, if you're running everything on server instances, sure. But if you're using the logging um, service of, the, of your cloud provider, when you migrate that application from cloud, you know, from AWS or to, to Microsoft or vice versa, you're going to have to re-engineer that application some to work with the logging service of your new cloud. So that was just something I wanted to throw in there as well is that, you know, the idea of multi-cloud will probably be around with us for a long time because it's not just as easy as moving a bunch of server instances from one environment to the other. Yeah. I can't believe it. I, I totally skipped over the fact that you got to be able to prove everything, right? <laughs> so I'm glad you brought us back to that. <laughs> no, no problem. Yeah, actually with that, um, that brings to mind, uh, you know, Identity Federation and CloudTrail with AWS where, you, you know, you have a log of information about people who even requested in based on their IAM identities. Um, so when you have the centralized logging, you have that single point of access to all salient logs that are created across accounts regions, um, which is really critical for security, right? But if it's fractured with a distributed data database, um, I would think that you really lose a lot of data integrity because of the complexity introduced there. And then I would question kind of ha handling failures, you know, how you distinguish site failure and link failure. Yeah, and one of the things that the applications across across multiple clouds. So this is one of the things that I've been thinking about is that if you have a cloud like if you, if one of your goals is to distribute an environment, distribute an application, I don't feel like you'd have to have it running at AWS and Microsoft. So if one goes down, the other is available because if you look at AWS or Microsoft, they've got data centers in around the world. So I guess you know, if you're really paranoid about your, you know, the entire company going down, that's one thing. But, you know, from a, a geographical load balancing perspective, they've got um, data centers in different regions of the U.S. and throughout the world. Um, so my thinking is that, you know, if you're if you were starting out today on like, let's start our 
our migration to the cloud, you'd pick one vendor and spin up services in more than one geographical location. You wouldn't say, hey, let's go to two different vendors in case we lose a vendor. Yeah, you don't want to overcomplicate it, especially if you're just starting out. Right. And then, I mean, if you're going to go to the cloud, I mean, it's kind of like level one is just spinning up server instances. The real benefit you get is if you get a level two, level three, which is to leverage the platform services for your application. So if you're using a, a common logging platform, if you're using a common um, NoSQL database or SQL database, but it's as a, as a service. Um, again, those services are going to look slightly different from cloud to cloud or from vendor to vendor, and your applications aren't going to be able to point exactly the same way across multiple clouds. Right on. I think that's probably a good spot we can leave it for now. Um, I certainly appreciate the conversation. Hopefully, Neil and others get some value out of what we talked about today. Morgan, appreciate you taking the time to join us. Welcome to the team. Welcome to the party. Yeah, thank you for having me. Jim, go Bears. <laughs> go Eagles. <laughs> and go, go Bills, right, Morgan? Yeah, go Bills. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> kind of. All right. All right, we're going to leave it there. Appreciate uh, folks taking time to listen to us. Hopefully, uh, you got some value out of it. Feel free to like, subscribe, listen, tell your friends, share the show, and uh, we'll be talking to you uh, on in the next one. You've been listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. To access all episodes, visit identityatthecenter.com.